A friend of mine posted this on Facebook last week. I'm broke. I'm not broke broke. I'm bills are paid, place to stay, food on my plate broke. Maybe you can relate. In a 2019 survey, it was found that the average person thought that being broke means having less than $878 available in cash or a bank account. That means that after paying your bills, paying for your food and shelter, at the end of the month, you have only $878 available to you. In other words, you're living paycheck to paycheck. In that survey, nearly 86% of the people surveyed either considered themselves to be broke or had been broke in the recent past. The survey also tracked what people reported as the reasons why they were broke, and those reasons varied widely among different generations. When asked why they were broke, 82% of all the people responded that it was because their basic expenses and bills were greater than their income. But beyond that, 28% of millennials, that is people who were born from 1981 to 1997, and 21% of Generation X, those people born from 1965 to 1980, they said they spent an additional amount of money on food. About 25% of millennials and 19% of Generation X said they spent money on unnecessary items, and that was the next biggest reason for their being broke. But for an older generation, uh, the baby boomers, those born from 1946 to 1964, the biggest reason given uh, for 21% of them was that they were helping someone else. Now that could be a matter of charitable giving, uh, but it's most likely a matter of helping their Generation X or millennial children or grandchildren who are also broke. These days it's pretty common for many people to be living paycheck to paycheck. And with so many people thinking that having about 900 bucks between their wallet and bank account is being broke, and considering that the national average just for rent in the U.S. is about $1,400 per month, it's no wonder that so many people are tense about money, to say the least. To make it worse, our culture seems to have an unhealthy relationship with stuff, money, new gadgets, new clothes, new cars, new whatever. We live in a world in which having stuff or getting more stuff is an indicator that life is good or that we're doing okay. But many times having that stuff or, or getting that stuff is actually making our lives worse, making us broke or worried about being broke. Amanda Clayman works a lot uh, with people like that. She's a licensed social worker who specializes in helping people deal with financial problems and the anxiety they have because of it. Now, Amanda is an expert not just because of her education and training, but because of her personal experience with being broke. When Amanda was 22, she moved to New York City and she worked in the nightlife industry, promoting clubs and motivating people to spend money in those clubs. At the same time, she was getting deeper in debt. And after she bounced a check to her hairdresser, she asked her mother to trim her hair a bit, and she got a terrible haircut that she couldn't afford to get fixed. That's when she finally admitted that she had a problem, that she had about $31,000 in debt. And then she got some help, and she got out of debt, and she redirected her career towards helping other people do the same. In a May 2020 interview with a New York Magazine website called The Cut, she said that at the height of the pandemic, really dramatic shifts in circumstances cause moments of deep, deep reassessment. Often those happen around life events like getting married or having a baby or approaching retirement. But what's different about this moment is that it's happening to so many people at the same time. And even though everyone's dealing with this disruption on some level, each of us can feel very alone because our problems are unique. A lot of people are coming to me and saying things like, I don't feel safe, and what's it all for? How am I supposed to make any decisions about the future if it's all so uncertain? Or I poured my whole life into my business or my career and now it's been taken away from me. I can't depend on anybody.
Sound familiar? Even if you're not experiencing this yourself, you probably know someone who is. This kind of, this same kind of disruption or discomfort or fear that Solomon expressed in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 3. What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Now most people work hard all day, every day, throughout their whole lives just to get by. And still they wonder, what's the point? Whether they have a good job or a bad job, a job they like or a job they hate, whether they've lost their job or can't find a job, or have retired from working, many people have an underlying tension in their life that's based on what they have or don't have. Money, food, shelter, clothing, the other stuff we need or want in everyday life. When we don't have it or, or lose it, or when we just want more, bad things start to happen in our lives. Whether in our own hearts and minds, or in our homes, in our community, or just in general all around us. At some point, it leads people into desperation. And like I said last week, desperate people say and do desperate things. So listen for the tension in the situation that Solomon describes in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 8, through chapter 6, verse 9. Solomon writes, If you see the poor oppressed in a district, and justice and rights denied, do not be surprised at such things, for one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. The increase from the land is taken by all, the king himself profits from the fields. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son, there is nothing left for him. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry in his hand. This too is a grievous evil. As a man comes, so he departs, and what does he gain since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness, with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink, and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun, during the few days of life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on men. God gives a man wealth possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing his heart desires. But God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. A man may have a hundred children and live many years, yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without me meaning, it departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man, even if he lives a thousand years twice over, but fails to enjoy his prosperity. Do not all go to the same place. All man's efforts are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. What advantage has a wise man over a fool? What does a poor man gain by knowing how to conduct himself before others? Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. 
Now here Solomon describes the struggles and consequences of the emptiness many people experience because of stuff, money, wealth, possessions, and our relationship to it. Whether because we don't have what we need or because we don't have what we want, many people suffer or even cause others to suffer because of the stuff of this world. Some people who, who don't feel like they have enough take from others, like it says in chapter 5, verse 8, even to the point of oppressing the poor. Some people just love money, but like it says in chapter 5, verse 10, they're never satisfied. And even when we live in a world that, that has plenty of stuff, in chapter 5, verse 11, it says that there's always more people there who consume it without satisfaction. And even when we have what we want, some people, as it says in chapter 5, verse 12, they lose sleep over what they're going to do with it or how they're going to keep it. Even when we recognize the simple facts of life that Solomon reminds us there in verse 15, that we've brought nothing into this world when we we're born and we won't take anything with us when we die, many people miss the simple enjoyment of the things that God provides in everyday life which Solomon points out in verse 19, is a gift of God. Now that's where we find the problem, the disconnect between satisfaction and dissatisfaction. That's the reason why living our everyday lives under the sun or under, the hev under heaven, pursuing things of this world separate from God, it's meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Even though the things of this world and the enjoyment of them are gifts from God, when we're more interested in the gifts and not the one who has given them to us, we're never going to be satisfied and we're always going to be broke. Instead, we need to be filled by God, not his gifts. Maybe it's because we don't think of our everyday needs being a gift from God, because we have an underlying feeling of, well, if I need it, we deserve it, and so we better get it or else. And so we get fixated on what we want or need and what we need to do to get those things. Instead, we need to trust God and find satisfaction in Him. Jesus reminds us that God knows what we need, and if we go to Him, that He will give what we need, saying in Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give such good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? God gives not only because we have needs, but because he loves us. Remember the survey? that. Many baby boomers said that they were going broke because they were giving to others who need help. And I said that it was most likely to their kids or grandkids. Well, God doesn't go broke, but he gives for the same reasons. Because he's our Father in heaven. So when we're struggling just to get by, when we don't seem to have enough, when things seem to crowd out everything and everyone else, when we're suffering because other people are fixated on getting more money or, or things at our expense, whether they're our company, our, our boss, our co-workers, our government, our spouse, even our kids or grandkids, we need to understand that not only are we never going to find satisfaction in the stuff of this world, but that only God truly fills us when we're running on empty. And Solomon seems to be telling us this throughout these verses. Now, first of all, Solomon seems to be reminding us that stuff steals satisfaction. And we can see that idea of theft uh, in these verses. In, in verse, chapter 5, verse 8, when Solomon describes poverty as one government official taking from the poor because the official who's above them is taking what is theirs, and whoever's above them taking what is theirs, and so on and so on, up the chain of command until, well, we read in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 9, that the increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. Now, in chapter 5, verse 12, it says that uh, wealth robs the rich of their sleep. And in verse 14, it says that misfortune robs children of their inheritance and future. 
In chapter 6, verse 2, it tells us that a person's wealth, uh, possessions, and honor can be taken by strangers so that they can enjoy them. And in chapter 6, verse 6, it says, even after a thousand years, double a thousand years of prosperity, its meaning and satisfaction are taken by death. Now, how does stuff steal our satisfaction? Forgive me, but it's kind of like little kids in toilet paper. If a little bit is good, a lot is better, and they keep on using more and more until everything, well, overflows into a huge mess. Solomon wrote in chapter 5, verse 10, that money never has money enough. Money, wealth, stuff tends to draw more. You get a little bit and you like it, and you'd like a bit more. I went through this myself just this past week. I had purchased some new software several weeks ago, but just last Monday, the company announced that they were releasing a new version upgrade. And that's just the kind of thing that makes me want more. Now, at first, it looked like I was going to get uh, the, the upgrade uh, for 100 bucks, But then I saw that they were giving me $110 credit for, for being a new customer within the last month. And so I would have gotten the upgrade for free. But then I saw that the next step up was only $230. So instead of getting the new version for free, well, I paid $120 for the next upgrade. I mean, what I had was really good to begin with, but the temptation to get more stole my satisfaction with it. Jesus warned his disciples about this temptation, that the lure of stuff can steal our satisfaction in God. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus told a parable about a man who sowed some seed. Some of the seed was eaten by birds, some fell on rocky soil, and the plants died out quickly. Some fell among thorns that choked out the plants, and some fell on good soil and produced a good crop. Now Jesus explained very specifically in Matthew 13 verse 22 that the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Now, very simply, Jesus is telling us that the stuff of this world, money, riches, wealth, it takes advantage of our everyday worries and steals God's gifts, the, the blessings of the life that God wants us to receive from Him, especially our satisfaction in Him. Now, second, Solomon seems to be reminding us that God gives satisfaction. Where stuff steals our satisfaction, God gives us satisfaction in himself. Now, yes, God gives us the gifts. He blesses us in this life. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes 6 verse 2 that God gives a man wealth, possessions, and honor so that he lacks nothing his heart desires. But God does not enable him to enjoy them, and a stranger enjoys them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. Now, what Solomon's writing there isn't a matter of God giving us things that we just can't enjoy, but when God does give us what we need, even more than what we need, what we want, if we want to enjoy those things without Him, we find that we can't because our satisfaction isn't in those things. Remember, Jesus said that the things of this world promise what they can't deliver. The satisfaction is in God himself who provides those things. Now, after warning the church not to trust stuff for satisfaction or stability, James reminds the church of this in James chapter 1, verse 17, that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Now, how does God give us satisfaction that the things of this world can't? because God doesn't change. Jesus tells us to put our trust in God and not in the things of this world. He, he said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The things of this world rust and break down. Money doesn't last. Investments change from moment to moment. Now, yeah, those things are important, even necessary in our everyday lives, but they just don't last. Stuff isn't stable, but God is. And so we need to trust God to give us satisfaction. But how do we know that we have found satisfaction? Obviously, it's not in the stuff of this world. So, so where does it come from? Well, it's got to be in our hearts, like Jesus said. Where your treasure is, there, that's where your heart will be. So where's your heart? Is it in your wallet, your bank account, your portfolio, your car, your house, or, or some other stuff? If that's where your heart is, be careful, because your satisfaction isn't going to last. When the stuff goes, your satisfaction will go with it. Where your heart is, that's the real treasure. Now that's the struggle of everyday life under the sun. Do I just want God's gifts or do I want God himself? Paul understood the struggle that Solomon describes. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Now, Paul's basically saying, I get it. I've gone without the stuff I need, and I've had plenty of it. But the one thing that doesn't change, with stuff or without it, I am satisfied in God. I'm satisfied in Christ, who gives me the strength I need. Where was Paul's heart? Well, it was in God. Where was Paul's treasure? It's in the same place, in God, through his faith in Jesus Christ. Even when Paul was broke, he trusted God for the strength he needed. Paul found satisfaction in God himself and not in the stuff of this world. And we can do the same. We get a different perspective of life and the things of this world when we put our trust in God. Then we can see the blessing that Solomon describes in chapter uh, Ecclesiastes 5, uh, verses 19 and 20. He says, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. God gives us blessings in everyday life and we can enjoy them with God. Even if we lose those things, even if those things tend to steal our satisfaction, when we put our trust in God himself, he gives us the ability to enjoy what we have, or even what we don't have, because we have him. And with that perspective, with that relationship with God, even the poor, even those who are oppressed, if they trust God, they can find enjoyment in every day even if it's just one bite or just in one breath, even if their oppressors take their life because they have life with God. Again, that's Paul's perspective, which he explains in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 24. He writes, for, me, or for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Now we already know from Paul's life, from our own experiences, that life in this world can be pretty lousy. But Paul says, in Christ, life is better. Paul made the choice between finding satisfaction in the stuff of this world and finding satisfaction in God. For Paul, it wasn't a hard choice. He found new life in Christ in this world, which leads to eternal life in Christ in heaven. We have the same choice. The stuff of this world that steals our satisfaction or God himself 
who gives satisfaction. Now we might be broke by the world's standards, but when we put our trust in God, we have a full life because, as Paul says, we have fruitful labor in Christ. And even if we die in this world, we still have new life in Christ. So what's your choice? I mean, you already know that the things of this world aren't as stable as we would like them to be or as fulfilling as they promise to be. Wouldn't it be better to trust God who not only promises satisfaction and new life, but who also enables us to live full lives even when we're broke? Now, church, I know that this can be a challenge for us as well. And Paul makes that very clear. But since we believe that God gives new, full life through our faith in Jesus, we need to live like we believe it, like we've already received it. The world is watching us to see whether we believe we're broke or blessed, whether we're focused on the stuff of this world or on the one who gives us everything as gifts. And we're going to show them in the ways that we take care of each other in the church, in the ways that we love others in the world in the ways that we take care of what we have, and in the ways that we live without what we want or need. Ultimately, in the ways that we reflect the one who has given us this new full life. But if you haven't yet found that new full life that God offers to everyone who puts their faith in Jesus, I encourage you to check that out right away. You can receive that new life when you believe that Jesus is who the Bible tells us he is, the Christ, the, the Son of God who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life that starts right now and continues into eternity. When you repent and turn away from your old sinful life and turn back to God, when you confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and when you join with Jesus in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, and when you do that, God will forgive you and give you a new, full life. And then God, the Holy Spirit, will come and live within you to help you live that new life right now with your new family, the church, until Jesus comes back to take us to be with God in heaven forever. Now, if you're ready to make that decision, or if you've got any questions or want to talk through anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ so that we can get together as soon as possible. But until then, please let me pray for you. Father, thank you for everything that you have given us as we live every day in your creation. Lord, we know that it's really easy for us to receive those gifts and experience your love and then to let those things steal our attention from you. And so I ask for your forgiveness. But Father, thank you for the forgiveness and the new life that you offer through Jesus. And I pray right now for those who have not yet received that forgiveness and new life, uh, that you would continue to reveal yourself to them, that you would uh, prompt your people, the church, to lead them to yourself uh, through your word and, and by your spirit. And, and I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.